It seriously started in 1984 when I thought it would be nice to own a video camera. Typically, like every new camera owner, I spent the rest of the summer shooting lengthy footage of famous landmarks, favorite campsites, the Pike Place Market, and found myself reviving some old ideas from my days spent studying filmmaking as a graduate student at Syracuse University. Performance art was a regular two-week segment of the basic design classes I was teaching as a graduate student in 1967 through 69. So the seeds for teaching this discipline were planted early. For part of my thesis requirement, I wrote, directed, and performed my first performance lecture entitled The Pop Culture and Andy Warhol. In presenting this survey of pop art with an in-depth focus on Andy Warhol, I checked out almost every piece of audiovisual equipment from media services <laughs> and assembled a tongue-in-cheek interpretation of Andy Warhol. I forged a 16 millimeter film on Warhol, titling it Back, claiming that I discovered the film undocumented in the New York Public Library. <laughs> I fabricated an exclusive interview with Warhol, interviewing instead one of my fellow graduate students in sculpture with a 45 record of one of Warhol's famous parties playing in the background, supplying ambient party sound. Everyone believed what they heard and learned more than they realized about Andy Warhol. But I learned something even more about performance art. So upon returning to Lawrence from Seattle in the fall of 84, I was filled with a new sense of creative excitement with my new video equipment. During that fall, I remember attending a faculty show opening at the Kansas Union Gallery and seeing then Lawrence choreographer dancer Marsha Paladin, with whom I was casually acquainted with at the time. I mentioned to her my interest in pursuing some ideas in video that were similar in content to my paintings. We both felt that it might be worthwhile to experiment with videotaping live performers in my studio. Eventually, Marsha began to bring two to three dancers over every Wednesday evening, where they would dance and improvise while wearing kimonos and face masks. Eventually, the potential for serious work became apparent. Shortly thereafter, I began asking friends to assist me in shooting short vignettes of scenes from my grandmother's diaries as represented in the painting series called the Diary Series, executed from 1980 to 83. At the time, my theatrical interests were limited in exploring only the implied events implicit before and after the frozen moment or composition of the painting. In November of 1984, I decided to have a coming out party by challenging myself to stage a short piece at the Kellis Gallery here in Lawrence entitled Toku's Dance. While the piece was virtually contentless, it did provide me with an opportunity to combine dance, choreography, music, lighting, and props, along with the more mundane chores of organizing, publicizing, and schlepping. With perhaps a premature sense of accomplishment and confidence, I accepted an invitation from the music department to collaborate with the composer in producing a short piece for the Symposium of Contemporary Music in the University Theater. I was recommended to Jim Stringer, then director of sound for Centron Film Corporation, to write a collaborative piece for what was to become the first act of the Seven Kabuki Plays. The American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. This 14-minute performance depicted the events that occurred in my grandmother's life on Pearl Harbor Day in 1941 as described in her wartime diary. One self-imposed requirement was to move the performance through a similar composition that existed in the corresponding diary painting, executed around four years earlier. After the initial presentation at Crafton Pryor, I decided to extend the idea into a full-fledged theater piece. Not aware at the time of how long this piece would ultimately become, I presented Act One and two additional acts at Washburn University four months later. 
In the early winter of 1985, I began to make plans to write my next performance piece. The idea of writing this piece during one continuous period of uninterrupted time for some reason interested me. Friends from Ogden, Utah told me about the Trans-Siberian Railroad and how they have always wanted to take the 6,000 mile journey across the Soviet Union. The idea intrigued me. My friend David Kassman loaned me a book called The Little Red Train. After reading this, I knew that I had found my place to write my next performance. For seven days and nights, armed with audio tapes of music ranging from 1960s post-bop jazz to Japanese rock and roll, a sketchbook and a dozen yellow pads, I drafted piece after piece as I gazed at the pasking landscapes of the Great Wall of China, outer and inner Mongolia, the Gobi Desert, and finally a partially frozen Lake Baikal. From there, the train swung westward and traveled through the entire distance of Siberia, finally reaching Moscow a week later. By then, a grand total of 20 pieces were drafted and were to be polished during late evenings in Leningrad and London. The Trans-Siberian excerpts eventually became a suite of nine pieces ranging from four to 15 minutes in length. At all of the performances, the audience was kept out of the theater till it was time to begin. When the doors were open, they were greeted by a room filled with fake smoke and the loud sound of a train running on tracks. Kurogos were situated all around the room, simulating searchlights with their flashlights assisting people in finding their seats. After everyone was seated, two performers dressed as Soviet guards performed manual of arms before changing to costumes of Japanese male comic dancers. This was followed by a film and performance piece entitled Set Me Free, a feminist statement about post-war Japanese women. Moon Seen as Exiles was a parody based upon a poem on the internment. Junko's song was a lip sync to a cutesy Japanese pop song with visual references to symbolic objects and suicide. Minidoka Girls, a pantomime to an angry poem written by one of the older internees. Him was meant to be a comment on war, sushi, and the Hawaiian Japanese American veterans using objects that have previously been depicted in my paintings. The final and most difficult piece was called Three Haiku. This was a very complex performance for me to write. The haikus discovered among my grandmother's writings were, number one, this is the place where I bury the bones of my son who died in the war. Number two, for 20 years I raised my son to make him an enemy of my country. Number three, drafted by our enemy, my son learned the Japanese language. Dividing this poem into three parts, I could not make the images correspond to the words and flow with compound meanings. I decided to reverse the lines and found the new order to be far more interesting in its implications. Therefore, the piece began with a suicide, followed by flowers being removed from the disemboweled belly. The same male figure made a transition to a kimono figure who slowly deflowers a plant, then turns into a disgraced monk that roams the countryside. Near the end of the piece, the figure finally transforms into an angry young male figure that devilishly dances to Japanese rock and roll music. <laughs>